Okay, so in this lecture we're going to talk just a little bit about the basics of chromatography and chromatograms, uh, the data that you get out. So in chromatography what we measure is usually retention time. So what's the time it takes for the analyte to come out? Um, and so, you know, you'll get a chromatogram, right, that looks something like this. And so there's some sort of signal we measure depending on the detector, right, and the x-axis is time. Uh, and so we were looking at retention time. Now if we have a column and we push something through, we flow it through, even if it spends no time in the stationary phase, it's going to take some given amount of time just to push everything through that column. And so there's some time that would take just to push basically the mobile phase through the column, even if there was no analyte interactions. And so we usually call this time T sub M. So it's the time for the mobile phase to go through the column. And so um, this, again, is where anything that would be unretained by the stationary phase would come out. Oftentimes you'll get a peak there, sometimes you won't, but there's always this sort of time, and everything needs to be measured off of that time. That time really doesn't count as far as separation. But then we get peaks that come out later, and so that means those peaks have somehow, the analytes have interacted with the stationary phase. Um, and so, you know, we'll get some sort of retention time Uh, that uh, tells us about um, where our peaks come out. Now we talked if in the sort of thermodynamic lesson about K, uh, the big K being the equilibrium, you know, coefficient, uh, coefficient, the concentration of A in the stationary phase over the concentration of A in the mobile phase. The problem is this, we don't really measure K, big K. Uh, instead, the factor that we like to use out of the chromat uh, chromatogram is um, a K prime. I always write my little Ks as cursive just so you can tell little K from big K. Uh, little K uh, and this K prime is usually called the capacity factor. Uh, and so the capacity factor we can get from the chromatogram. So it's equal to T sub R over T sub M divided by T sub M. So we're, again, subtracting out this time for the mobile phase and then dividing by it. Um, it's related to this big K, though, because it's equal to big K times the volume of the stationary phase over the volume of the mobile phase. Um, and so now you can see why nobody really likes this definition. This definition, it's useful, but it's not that useful because who knows what those volumes really are. So we won't use it very much um, uh, practically. Uh, but again, this allows us to relate retention time to something that relates back to K. Now I want to show you, I just want you to realize that K prime is kind of a linear thing. So that, you know, if you have a retention, you have a K prime of 1, right? That means that your retention time, right, is 2 times Tm. If you wanted to get 1 back out here, right, you'd be 2 times Tm minus Tm over Tm. That would get you that. So, you know, in this chromatogram, these are about equally spaced, right? So that's about 1. If this was about equally spaced, right, this would be a k prime then of equal to 2. So it's sort of a linear thing on down the line from there. Okay, so now that's how we look at a, a chromatogram and look at one peak. But what if we have two peaks? Uh, you know, separations is usually about separating. <laughs> and that's uh, two compounds, right, uh, appear to separate. So they have to find a factor called alpha. And alpha is a selectivity factor. So you want to know how, you know, the, the two things will separate. We're going to look at two analytes, and so alpha is just big K, the equilibrium coefficient for analyte B over the big K for A. Uh, uh, and you say, which is B and which is A? Uh, alpha, is, this one is always defined as the one that is more retained. So, you know, in this diagram, this would be A and that would be B. Uh, so B is always further down the line, and so that means alpha is always greater than uh, so that's how we know which is A and which is B. Um, and so 
it's this ratio of k's. I just erased the equation. Remember that k, k prime and k were proportional with those volumes? Well, if I had those volumes, they'd be the same. And so we can actually say that this is also proportional to k prime, the capacity factor for b over k prime of a. So now I have things I can use. And so basically, you're going to see right, that this one is equal to the retention time b minus t sub m over t sub m, and the next one would be re equal to t sub r of a minus t sub m over t sub m. Those t sub m cancel out, so I kind of took them out of the equation. And so this ends up being the definition of alpha. If we want to look at a and b and how good they're going to sort of selectivity is going to be between the two, and the bigger the number, the better separated the peaks are. Um, and so we can look at that. You know, things that are 1.1, you're probably not going to see, but you get up to 1.52, you're probably going to be able to separate those. There's also a question of how good a column is. Um, and so this leads us to some more theory for chromatography. It leads us to the theory of theoretical plates. Uh, so theoretical plates is sort of comes from the idea of, let's take a column, and I'm just going to put it this way. I'm going to divide it up into little bitty like sort of segments. And imagine in each segment I do a separation, I come to equilibrium, you know, between the stationary phase and the mobile phase, and then the analyte would go to the next segment, and the next segment, and the next segment, on down the line. That's the idea of theoretical plates. So the, the question is, how many plates do you have in your um, uh, column? And so theoretical plates, uh, we're going to just use a big N for the number of theoretical plates. Um, and uh, then each of these plates, so we're going to have a whole length of a column. So the length of the column uh, is going to be L, right? You have a 20 centimeter column or something like that. And then how big each little plate would be then, right, is going to be H. And so H is the height of... Uh, of a theoretical plate. So H is the height of a theoretical plate. So um, when we uh, uh, do that, then we can define big N as being L over H. So notice that makes N dimensionless, and L and H would both have a unit of like distance, like centimeters usually is the unit that we have them in. Um, okay, so what we want to do then for a column is we want to maximize the number of theoretical plates we have. And so that really means that we want to end up minimizing the H. So we'll talk about sometimes the N, sometimes H, but remember we're going to maximize N, which means we want to minimize H. So how do we figure out this theoretical plate? Again, we don't have a column that's divided up really this way. It's, it's kind of an um, archaic way to think about it. But we do have a peak, right? Uh, and so for that peak, it's going to have some sort of width. And we're going to assume that our peak is Gaussian, uh, is uh, the sort of assumption. If we do that, uh, we can get a sort of standard deviation right out of this peak, a sigma. Um, um, from this peak, and that's going to be, again, this peak at the moment is going to be in distance units. This is spread out in a column, so imagine, you know, sort of a peak over here. Uh, it's spread out in a column, so in distance. And then from there, we can define H, and H is defined then as sigma squared in the distance uh, domain divided by L. So that's the theoretical plate. Um, uh, it kind of relates to how wide your peak is. Okay, so how many peaks we can fit in kind of um, goes back to that. That kind of makes sense. Um, there's only one problem with this definition, and that is when I drew your chromatogram that I just erased, it wasn't in distance, right? It was in time. So normally the peak that we measure, right, the x-axis is time, not distance. And we would still have a... Um, you know, uh, uh, it'd still be Gaussian, right? But now we're going to have a um, sigma, right? But it's going to be in time. Instead of being in distance, it's going to be in time. Uh, and so we have to sort of look at how to um, look at these. And so there's an equivalence that you can kind of come up with, and it's this. 
that sigma t over t sub r ends up being equal to sigma l um, over l. And so we can get back and forth between time and distance. Um, there's also something that chromatographic people have used for a while, and that is they'll talk about the width of the base. Uh, and so they'll talk about the width um, of the base. And the width is just defined as being four standard deviations. So two standard deviations on either side get you about 99% of the points. So, you know, the width in time units would just be uh, equal to four times sigma t. So if we do that and we plug some things back into equations, probably the equations I'm Racing right now uh, with n, we can come up with a definition of n uh, in um, uh, length units. And so it ends up being 16 t sub r squared over w uh, in the time, the width and the time thing squared. Uh, again, it's just plugging back into um, the L over h with a definition for h that's in this unit. So. Uh, go go back and sort of try and figure out where that comes from, but it it, it comes out pretty easily. Um, uh, again, we really care about two peaks and whether they're well resolved. We'd love our peaks to look like that, right? In reality, sometimes they look like this, right? So that's not well resolved. Uh, and so if we're going to talk about resolution. Um, uh, we need to talk about um, sort of how well resolved things are. And the definition of resolution um, is it's the difference in the retention times, right? So there'd be one retention time of B and A, right? So that delta T over whatever the average width is um, in time. So again, this one's going to have a width, this one's going to have a width. Average those together, and we'll get a resolution value. In general, we're going to say that if the resolution value is greater than about 1.5, we're going to say that the peaks are resolved, uh, uh, meaning baseline resolution, that it comes back to baseline. But something like this would probably have a resolution less than 1, meaning the peaks are not baseline resolved. Um, okay, so we talked about the fact, I won't erase my peaks for a minute, that they're a little wide. Why are my peaks wide? Um, uh, that's the question to sort of answer. Uh, um, I'm going to put it in chromatography terms. What causes band broadening, i.e., why are my peaks wide? Why are they not narrow little bands? Um, and there's really three answers for this. Um, and so they come into part of, a, of an equation. Um, and so I'm going to give you, I'm going to call them A, B, and C because those are the terms in the equation. So the first answer, A, has to do with path length. Uh, and this is termed eddy diffusion. So imagine for a minute over here, I'm going to draw my column. And I'm going to draw my stationary phase of particles. I don't want them really that, uh, you know, orderly packed, but I always seem to draw them like that. Um, and so imagine I start here, and I'm in light A, and I'm in the red, and I want to go through, and I make it through like that. Well, I took a pretty short path to make it through that column, right? That's pretty darn efficient of me. Imagine I'm in light B, and I start from the same place. But now I too, you know, as it goes through, it's got to go around the particles, and so it goes on that path. Same place, same starting place, same ending line, right? Same finish line, but it took a different path. So there are multiple different path lengths that you can take, and that's eddy diffusion. The reason that they don't all arrive at the column at the same time, um, you have to go through that. How do you minimize this? The answer is to use very small particles. So if you have huge particles and one goes around and the other doesn't, that's a big difference in path length. If you have small particles, it ends up to even out um, and that everybody kind of goes around the same way. All right, the B term of this equation is called longitudinal diffusion. Um, and so longitudinal diffusion is kind of what it sounds like. It's diffusion, if I have my column, it's diffusion 
in the, this direction. So I, even I were able to get my peak into a small band, because of entropy and mixing stuff, stuff is going to want to diffuse out from the center. Uh, and so it wants to diffuse as you go along. So you can imagine if I could get it all in a really narrow band, right, and I just would let it sit there, right, it would diffuse out over time following its concentration gradient. Uh, and so longitudinal diffusion ends up being inversely proportional to velocity down the column. So if I go really fast and I push my stuff out really fast, right, it doesn't have much time to spread out. But if I go super slow, then it's going to have more time to spread out. Uh, and so that's the B term, stuff spreading out um, there. The C term is probably the hardest one to understand. And that is, it's the resistance to mass transfer term. Uh, and so the best way, I think, to really explain at least a part of it is this. Imagine this is your particle um, uh, um, that's in there, that is your stationary phase. It usually has some sort of solid core. We're not going to think about that very much. And then it's got a coating of stationary phase. And this coating of stationary phase has some sort of thickness um, on it. Um, some sort of thickness, we'll just call it D, uh, for the thickness. Now your molecule, we'll make our molecule red at the moment, can only go between the stationary phase and right outside here is the mobile phase, right? If it's on the edge. If your molecule gets buried right here in the middle, right, it can't go back to the stationary phase until it makes its way out right to the edge. And when it's on the edge, now, right, it's free to go in and out of the stationary phase to the mobile phase. So that's a resistance to mass transfer, that basically, again, your molecule sometimes gets buried in the stationary phase and is not available to go. Um, and so this one ends up being proportional to velocity. Because basically, if you went really slow, you could get into perfect equilibrium and you could wait as long as you needed for the molecule to get back here uh, to be able to transfer to the mobile phase. And so you can see that there's sort of an interesting um, relationship here that uh, the B term, or just the band spread, is inversely proportional to velocity. It's better to go fast, but for the C term, you would rather go slow. Um, and so uh, it leads to an interesting sort of shape of the curve. Let's look at the curve for a minute. Um, actually, I'll write up the equation and then we'll look at the curve. Um, so the equation that, that describes all this is called the Van Diemter. Um, equation and so it just says this H remember that's our height of a theoretical plate that we want to minimize we want to minimize H right it's equal to a plus B over u plus C times u where u is the mobile phase velocity so that's our equation we can make a graph of this and actually, we can graph all of the terms separately. Let me see if I have enough colors to do it. So we graph the A term. The A term is independent of velocity. Again, it just depends on the particle size, so no matter what the velocity, it's going to be the same. The B term, longitudinal diffusion, is inversely proportional to velocity, and so it ends up looking somewhat like that. So this is the B term. It comes down like that, um, which is inversely proportional to velocity. And then the C term is proportional to velocity. Again, um, it would be better to go slow, and so we get something that looks like that. That's the C term. And so if we add all of these together, I'm going to draw it in black. The graph that we get out looks basically like a Nike swoosh. Let me draw it down here just to make sure you can see what the final velocity looks like. It looks like that. Uh, again, it's, it looks like the Nike swoosh. And where you want to operate, theoretically, right, would be at the minimal of F. And so this would be your optimal uh, velocity, right, would be at that minima. Because uh, we want to minimize H, which allows us to maximize N. All right, so that's the end of our chromatography uh, theory part.